the Indianapolis Speedway is obviously the World Series of auto racing. In my opinion, there's no race in the world that compares to the Indy 500. If you really want to become famous, you have to drive at Indianapolis. And if you're lucky enough to win it, that makes you even twice as famous. The Indy 500 has been a symbol of speed, of everything that is American for a very long time. It is the single most important racing single event that happens every year. And they're racing at Indianapolis into the first turn. Oh my God, the terrible crash. There's a mechanic really on fire. He passed a car. What happened is clear. What's he doing? It was uh, never denied. Oh, look at that. He's passed about half a dozen cars. Bobby Unser did pass cars under the yellow. You can't do that. And I feel well. I hope that somebody saw that. You can't do that. I didn't do anything wrong. It just was a question how you read those rules. Mario Andretti finished second in the race today, or did he? Welcome to Classic Big Ticket. I'm Jack Aroot. The 1981 Indianapolis 500 was arguably the most controversial in the history of the event. For the first time, its champion was decided not on the track, but in a hearing room. The trophy changed hands between two racing legends, Bobby Unser and Mario Andretti, over a controversial blending rule which dictated where a driver was supposed to merge onto the track coming out of the pits under a yellow flag. Now, who followed the rule and who didn't? And was this blending rule clear? As you're about to discover, it remains a point of contention to this very day. The race was also notorious for a terrible crash involving Danny Ungaius and a fire in Bobby Unser's teammate Rick Mears's pit that left Mears and several crew members with severe burns. Now, throughout the next two and a half hours, Classic Big Ticket will roll out the race just as it appeared on ABC Sports and have commentary from the men in the middle of the storm, both certified legends of the Brickyard. We welcome our first guest, Bobby Unser, a three-time Indy 500 champion, a two-time IndyCar champion, 35 IndyCar victories to his credit, He's been inducted into the Indianapolis Motorsports Hall of Fame in 1990 and the Motorsports Hall of Fame in 1994. And he comes to us from his home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We also welcome our second guest, Mario Andretti. He was the winner at Indianapolis in 1969, the winner at Daytona in the 500 in 1967. He's a four-time IndyCar champion, 52 IndyCar career victories to his credit, and he was the 1978 Formula One world champion Mario comes to us from his home in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Mario, I was going to introduce you as the 1981 Indy 500 champion, but that only lasted for about six months. Well, it did, obviously, and um, we're going to get into that one. We got a cheater there on the other side that we have to talk to. And, uh, <clears throat> and I'll put to bed the fact that the, the rule was not a controversy. It was a rule. It was pretty clear. Now, fellas, before we get started, let me try to put the blend rule into layman's terms. During caution periods, a driver can gain an advantage over other drivers during a pit stop. Now, back in 1981, there was no published blend rule. The closest published rule was USAC's rule 9.7, entitled Signaling to Contestants, which stated under the term yellow flag, and I quote, passing another competitor or the pace car without permission will result in penalties of the loss of one or more laps. Now, there did exist, instead, a verbal agreement among drivers that cars would blend back onto the track following their pit stops in such a way that any advantage gained by those cars over those that remained on the track behind the pace car would be neutralized. Now, I understand that this is the first time that you two have sat down together uh, to discuss the 1981 Indy 500. Why has it taken so long, fellas? Well, There's it's over with. Discuss. It's There's been over nothing. with a long time. Let me talk, Bobby. Okay, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, if I was in Bobby's shoes, I would have probably done the same thing as far as appealing the decision and all that sort of thing. The bottom line, however, is that uh, it's clear that he violated a rule that was in place, a rule that was also tested. But it seemed like in this situation, uh, even though after so many months, of going back and forth with hearings and, and all that sort of thing, they obviously could see that Bobby did pass these cars under the yellow, uh, and, um, and they said, okay, uh, he committed this infraction, but now we think that, that this panel of three judges that was assembled 
uh, <clears throat> decided that uh, the penalty was too severe, so they they uh, they fined him forty thousand dollars. I think that was the part that was uh, the toughest part to to accept. Uh, nothing, and I blame uh, USAC. I think uh, Indianapolis did what they needed to do. Their officiating was right on, and then USAC sort of uh, crumbled under the pressure uh, of Roger Penske and and uh, his. Uh, his lawyers, uh, and again, I don't blame him. I would have done the same thing, but they could see that uh, the infraction was there, but the rule didn't seem to apply because he crossed the finish line first. And again, you know, we'll see that, uh, you know, he was, he probably would have won anyway, so I don't know why the heck he did that. <laughs> but uh, the fact is that um, the rule book was thrown out because he crossed the finish line first, and my contention was, if that was the case, then um, I'd take a $40,000 fine any day to be able to try to cheat and, uh, and, win, and win the 500. Bobby, you've been shaking your head. I know that this had to be the most patience you've ever had to exhibit in your life. It's your and I have to sit here and I have to sit here and listen to that. That's what's bad. <laughs> you guys told me to do that. Come on, cheater. I disagree, Come on. With, I disagree with everything that Mario said, with the exception oh. of the very last part where he says, you sack handle it very badly. They darn sure did do that. But at any rate, number one, the $40,000 that they fined me was merely to take up for the court cost that they'd had. They could do that because there's no rule to stop that. Number two, leaving the pits. The pit in the rule books went from the pits and the exit of the pits was completely in turn two. Tom Benford didn't understand racing. He never covered that. No, no, and no, I no. did read it. And plus, now no, let's no. just take Let's just no. take the devil's advocate. Hang on Bobby. just a minute. I had to be quiet for a minute. Let's well, take I the devil's advocate. <laughs> Let's just say that, for example, that I did. I did pass those cars, incidentally, but that was legal. But let's just say oh, no. that for some reason or another, they say that it isn't legal. You did exactly the same thing, and it's on tape, and also in all the scoring deals that showed up. So don't tell me that it's wrong for me, but it's right for Mario, because that doesn't fly. Okay, fellas, hold on. You both will have plenty of opportunities later in the program to state your case. But we're going to start our engines and cue up Jim McKay and Jackie Stewart, who called the race for ABC Sports. Here it is. Welcome back to Classic Big Ticket. I'm Jack Arute, along with Bobby Unser and Mario Andretti. Bobby Unser, a lot of people that maybe are just new to the world of auto racing may not realize just how huge the Indianapolis 500 was back then. It certainly eclipsed anything that NASCAR would present on a weekly basis to its race fans. Oh, absolutely true. It, uh, Indy 500 is the biggest spectacle on Earth, the largest single sporting day event on Earth, and of course the television loan goes out to approximately 100 million people. So people have to realize it's the biggest single thing almost going on this Earth at any given time. Mario, I know when you were growing up in Trieste, Italy, you were certainly a fan of Formula One, but where did Indy fit into everything when you and Aldo and the Andretti clan moved to Nazareth, Pennsylvania? Well, basically, quite honestly, Jack, uh, uh, the only race that I really knew existed for sure in the uh, United States was the Indianapolis 500. And then, of course, the thing that was most impressive at my age was the fact that they were talking about all these speeds, because these are speeds we had never heard of even in Grand Prix racing in the average speeds you know were never up uh, in a 200 kilometer range this was uh, over 200 kilometer speed you know in speeds and uh, and that was uh, like a supernatural thing for me uh, you know to, to hear and, and that's what caught my, my attention. Mario back in 1969 when you won the Indianapolis 500 it was in a year old car and there were an awful lot of people that felt it was going to be the first of just a whole slew of races and Indy 500 that you'd be victorious at. When you pulled into victory lane, did you think likewise? I have, <clears throat> for sure. I mean, uh, just remember in 65, uh, my rookie year finished third, and I figured, gee, uh, you know, things look pretty good. And in 66, 67, I sat on pole. I had so much an advantage with the car, and I figured, hey, if I could have finished those two years, I would have probably won two of the easiest races in my life. And then, but I couldn't finish. I didn't finish 66, 67, 68. Next time I finished, I won. Then I figured, well, God willing, if I'm still around, you know, maybe I'll put a few more together. But uh, it just uh, wasn't going to be. Uh, I mean, I, 
uh, but that's the way it is, you know, that um, uh, there are things that you can't control and um, uh, the fact that I led as many laps as I led, it gives me a lot of the satisfaction that I've had a great time there and a lot of people may think, okay, the Andretti luck, you know, and, and, uh, and all of that, that uh, I would be totally disappointed. Uh, yeah, you're disappointed, obviously, but uh, I feel totally at peace with the fact that I've had a fantastic time there with all of my 29 years at Indy, and the fact, as I said, that I was able to lead as many laps is, uh, is all that important to me. And if the race was 400 miles, I think I would have won it like six <laughs> times, so. <laughs> you know, Mario, there is no truth, though, to the rumor that because Andy Granatelli planted that big kiss on you in, in winning in Victory Lane in 1969, that that was like the curse that pursued you the rest of your career. No, no, I still smell the garlic, though. <laughs> <laughs> now, on the opposite side of the spectrum, in terms of luck, Bobby Unser, you certainly had Lady Luck running with you more than once. Back in 1975, the race ended in, under rain conditions. You come back, and uh, you're victorious in 1981. How important is luck at the Indianapolis 500? Luck is important in everything in life, Jack. There's no question about that, but luck won't make everything. If you're not ready and able to take advantage of your luck, there's nothing good going to happen from it. When I won, I usually had fast cars, good cars and good teams. There's my 68 winning car. That was a very, very, very good car, but there were several of those cars in the race. Mine was faster than all the rest of them, and there's a reason for that. That's because we worked with the chassis and we had a couple little secrets the other guys didn't. There's my 75 car. That was an exceptionally good car, and we were going to win that race anyway, whether it rained or not. The thing about it is, is the rain, we didn't know when the race was going to legally stop or end, rather, from the rain. So I had to be awfully careful not to spin out because the rain was really deep. We were running on water that was just like uh, driving on a lake. In other words, the car had no directional stability whatsoever. So that one was really a close dropping out of. Welcome back to Classic Big Ticket. I'm Jack Arute, along with Bobby Unser and Mario Andretti. Mario, the Danny Ungaius crash back in 1981 took everyone's breath away. And probably one of the reasons why is because it looked more like an airplane crash than it did an automobile crash. What, what was the problem back then? Well, several problems. Obviously, the chassis were not built with the, uh, any type of criteria as far as looking at uh, crushability. And, um, and also, we had a fire situation that was forever present because uh, uh, a lot of that hadn't been addressed properly. But um, again, I think uh, as time progressed, we got smarter in the sense that uh, we started using the same knowledge that was available to make the cars go faster, perform better, to use in the safety. And that came from uh, the insistence of, uh, of us as drivers. And progressively, uh, thank goodness, uh, we've achieved uh, uh, enormous progress in that, in that area. Bobby, Jackie Stewart said during the course of the telecast that drivers force themselves to be emotionless in the cockpit of a race car. How difficult is it to cruise by under a caution and see Danny and Guy slumped over in the car the way he was? Well, Jack, number one, I've, I've just got to kind of bring up where Mario and I came from basically was midgets and sprint cars. And we were used to seeing approximately 50% of the drivers die in race car accidents. And we didn't like that. Of course, Indianapolis was a lot better than that. But when you saw a wreck like Danny and Gaius's, you saw, as Mario mentioned, a tremendous problems with the car construction. You see the whole front of the car is gone. That's bad. It's bad in every sense of the word, from what the people see, what it does to Danny, to the whole ball of wax. So it obviously had to be addressed. The drivers pushed an awful lot of it. The car owners pushed a lot. The engineers designed the cars better, better materials, put the driver back further in the car. All of these things happened, like the fires were addressed by breakaway fittings. And that means when the lines pulled apart during a wreck like that, they wouldn't leak even a drop of alcohol. And in the fuel bladders, fuel bladders that you could, you could shoot a gun into them later on and never have a leak. That had to happen. And it was our era, Mario, myself, and of course a lot of the other guys that helped it happen, unfortunately. We lost a lot of drivers in the meantime. In this particular race, there was a far more monumental fire down on Pitt Road that took Rick Mears right out of the race. 
And as we take a look at that, it's, you just can't see the fire at all. Alcohol just doesn't give you a flame to identify. Well, obviously, uh, yeah, that's the nature of alcohol fire. You can't, uh, you just can't see the flame. And, um, and again, here going back to the safety aspect, today, uh, everyone that's around that pit area, the crews, uh, are, are much better protected uh, with fire protection gear on and the helmets and so on and so forth. And, um, and also the fittings, a lot of things are better, just uh, more secure. Again, over time, the sport has learned an awful lot and has reacted toward making sure that a lot of the things that had been happening wouldn't happen again, I think was the responsible thing to do. And, and let's face it, uh, uh, today it's not expected, I mean, it's not accepted, I should say, to have mm -hmm. and to deal and to say, well, shrug it, it's dangerous, people are going to get hurt. We don't want anybody to get hurt. Rick was my partner. He was my teammate in the race that day, not partner, teammate. But at any rate, my car caught fire along about the same time. I don't know if you know this or not, Mario, but I had the same fire in the pits that Rick did. Both of our fueling things were the same. Both the cars were the same. Mine caught on fire. Rick and I handled it two different ways. He jumped out of the car and left his car and tried to get the fire put out. Myself on the other side of the coin, I thought differently and I tried to drive out of mine. And, and what I did, and it worked, but what I did, I'll show you with a camera here if you guys can see this. Here's, here's my uniform. This is the left sleeve on the uniform. Get it in the picture where it shows here. Oh, man. <laughs> and, and this is burned, and it burned completely through the fabric there. You can see with my fingers up in there. And it didn't go out, Mario, until I was down the back straight away. But I made a decision. I know about how long my clothing will last. It's awfully hot in there. Got burns over some of the other uniform. But that shows how bad it got right there. And it, at about probably 180 miles an hour, 175, the, the wind blowing by just snuffed the fire out, and I was okay. In the meantime, Roger Pinsky and his people try to make it where it won't happen again. But don't think for a minute I wasn't concerned. Mario That's a very, Bobby, very dangerous thing. Bobby, is, Bobby is, is that why you weren't thinking clearly after that incident? <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> Made my head work a lot better is what that did. <laughs> Maybe learn how to win. <laughs> Bobby and Mario will be back later and have a take on that controversial outcome of the 1981 Indy 500. Welcome back. I'm Jack Arrud along with Bobby Unser and Mario Andretti as we continue to look back at the 1981 Indianapolis 500. And Mario, your teammate Gordon Johncock may literally be the forgotten man in everything that went on in 1981. He certainly was running pretty darn well during the course of that race. Oh, yes, yeah, Gordon was really, uh, he was actually probably the one that could challenge Bobby uh, the best, uh, and, um, and he was definitely a player. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, he was, he dropped out right at the very end, which uh, uh, moved me from third to second. Bobby, what many people don't realize is the fact that in that race, your radios didn't work, and you, were re you had to revert back to the age-old technique of a pit board which meant that every time you came into pit road, it seemed as if you lost seven or eight spots. Just look at it this way. Every time we had a pit stop of any sort, I would come in a lap later because I had to get the sign. There were, there were most of them, we had a lot of yellows that, that race. So every time I'd come in, it'd be a lap later. They would have already pitted and the serial scoring, they'd be way out in front. With me, I'd, I'd get behind all those cars, which was the back of the fast group of cars, not the cars we'd left and stuff. But I had to pass them every single time. And every segment, for the most part, I would get back into the lead, and then it'd be time for another pit stop, which meant I'd go clear to the back again, because again, no radios. So I had a terrible deficit. My car was so good that year that I really, honest to goodness, think that I would have put a lap on Mario and Gordy. If we could have run without yellow flags, I could have really blown them off really good. As it was, I just beat them really bad. I'm not sure, Mario, if that was a slap shot or not, but I do want to <laughs> no. talk about your drive from the back row to the front. How difficult was it to get that Patrick Wildcat up there to compete with your teammate? Well, obviously, I still had to pass a lot of cars. Uh, when you start last, 
uh, he got a lot of disadvantages there, and uh, uh, and I was very happy with the performance that day, considering that, uh, uh, like you said, starting last and then finishing second, I uh, I felt that uh, as a team and and uh, myself, we did uh, all we could do that day. Quite honestly, um, again, I uh, especially in traffic, uh, you know, Bobby knows when. You know, the aerodynamics are skewed, you know, you got uh, a bigger problem as far as keeping your front end in. I had to go all the way down to the grass almost, to, you know, to be able to get that car turned through the corner. So uh, I did fight uh, an unusual situation there that uh, if I had been there probably uh, and had a couple days to get the race set up going, I would have probably caught on to it. But uh, anyway, you know, we may do. The car ran all day and, uh, you know, we had a, a, a good finish. Well, Mario, you, you said know, Jack, you, you got to remember one thing. I just want to interrupt there just a little bit. I'm used to that, Nothing Bobby. Wrong. That's not a problem. <clears throat> yeah, right. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Mario's driving. Mario's one heck of a good driver. As tough as I've ever run against. Read my book and you'll see that in there. He did a good job. He came from last. He did run good. No question about it. Gordy ran awfully good. But nobody had a car like I had that day, that particular year. I was really, really, really dialed in and good. And our team operated good. The fires almost put me out, put Rick out for sure. But there's no doubt in my mind that the Penske cars that year, we would have finished one and two had we been able to complete the whole race without the fire problem. All right, Bobby, we'll continue now, this conversation. I want to interrupt one second. Oh, I boy. said, if, <laughs> if the car was that good, you didn't have to do that under the aloe. You see, that was really my contention. And you know I even what, said Mario, that to McGee. You know what, Mario, that's what we're going to discuss. And if I had known that you were going to take it, right here, I can hardly boys, wait. When we come back later, we'll talk about the tumultuous end to the Indy 500 and the blend rule and all that led to the aftermath and the six-month journey for these two gentlemen. Welcome back to ESPN Classic. I'm Jack Arood, and you're watching the 1981 Indianapolis 500, a race whose outcome is still debated in the racing community. Joining us again are the two men who battled on the track and in the hearing rooms, Bobby Unser and Mario Andretti. Fellas, a few minutes ago, we, we just saw what trigger, triggered the now historic controversy. Bobby Unser roaring past the field, coming out of the pit stop with just about 100 miles to go in the race during a yellow flag. I want to start with you, Mario, and get your interpretation or your understanding of what the rule was on that given day. Well, the rule was very clear, Jack. Uh, when uh, the end of the pit wall was declared a blend line, and, uh, and obviously uh, it, it was a and then also was stated that you, when you come out of the pits, you look to the right. If technically you have the, uh, the group of cars alongside of you, you look at the car that's next to you, and, uh, and that's the car you blend in behind coming out of turn two. And, uh, and that's what everybody did, because obviously when Bobby and I came out basically together, and I looked to the right, my car was Foyt. And, uh, and I saw Bobby just go right up to the front. And then I said to Jim McGee, I said, what's going on? I said, Bobby's going all the way up to the front. He said, well, stay, do what you're supposed to do, go in at the end, coming out of turn two. So coming out of turn two, I was going to blend in front of, I mean, behind Foyt. And he was a lap behind at the time he let me go in front of him. And that, and that was that, which is allowed, by the way, as long as, he obviously, uh, he does. Yes, it is, Bobby. <laughs> and, uh, and if you look at the facts, everyone, every driver dur during that race that was in a similar situation did that. Nobody did, you know, uh, you know obviously it's a, it was a, 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 uh, a clear, clear rule. And, uh, and, and Bobby, just as a cheater, just chose to ignore it. Bobby, you got to get your due. And uh, first, I would be interested what your interpretation of the blend line and the blend rule was in 1981. Well, number one, Jack, there were an awful lot of 33 drivers started that race. Not any of the rest of them happened to remember it the way Mario does, so he must go here one ear one way and another That's ear fun. the other way. So therefore, what, what happens is if you read in the Indianapolis Motor <laughs> Speedway's rule books, you'll see that the pits end coming oh. off of turn two. <laughs> and as long as you are underneath the white line and across the short chute, 
between turn one and two, as long as you have two wheels underneath the white line, that's considered underneath the white line. So therefore, you don't blend in until you come off of turn two. But it also states in the rules that you shall not pass the pace car for any reason. Even if you beat the pace car to that place, you can't pass the pace car because in essence, that would give you a full lap to come back around. All right, fellas. Now, here's, here's everybody what, knew this is that really except funny. for Mario. This is really well, wait funny. a minute, fellas. I'll tell you what we've done. I want to go back and based upon the interpretations that you just gave us, I want to show to you, first of all, Bobby, the way you came out and the blend line according to Mario. All right, there's my car oh, coming out. That's the way it is. And Mario, there's where you're saying he should have blended in. Exactly. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm losing count here, Bobby. No, no, you're not. It's eight. I can tell you what it is. It's eight. <laughs> and yet it turned two. You did now what Bobby Unser, what you I say mean, even, was your uh, interpretation of the rule. Even, yeah, even the announcers, you know, Jackie Stewart uh, and Jim McKay picked that up. I mean, I can't now believe it. <laughs> now, wait a minute, fellas. I want to go. Now. Hold on a second, Bobby. I'll get to that in a moment. I want to go back now, Mario, and show the way you Bobby, dealt with the blend rule. Be quiet. Let me show you how you dealt with the blend rule. And again, there's, it's hard for us to see you because we're following Bobby, but you're back there coming up close to the blend line, or at least what you purported and thought was the blend line. As you pull out, you're looking, if you look to the right of the screen, you're looking for where you can pull in. So you were at least based upon your understanding, you were doing it one way, based upon Uncle Bobby's understanding, he was doing it another way. And that, I guess, fellas, is the crux of the issue that's been boiling and festering for the last 20 years or so. And even well, in the court deal, he passed two cars. Now, I passed eight, but the rules don't say. Now, if, I which I wasn't, but if cars, I was wrong, I did then not pass two cars, Bobby. You're, you're uh, not just a little bit pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. Now, I passed eight cars, and I fessed up to it. it. shows it. He passed two cars. So if that would have been the rules, again, which it wasn't, see? Bobby, don't, don't be, uh, you know, uh, don't try to, to, to interpret the rule or create new rules for yourself right now. I mean, <laughs> the, the fact is, uh, that rule was just as plain as, as you could ever paint it. The following year, there was the same thing. Nothing was changed at the driver's meeting. And Tom Binford said clearly, he says, you know what? This time, you know, there's going to be no appeal. This time, we're going to bring you in then. And that's the only thing that it changed, you said. But the rule was not changed. The rule remained the same. And I was there that year. You were not. You and can't they, you go for the something? next year. That doesn't work. They had to address all of those rules. Because Tom it, Binford no, no, didn't know didn't. any more about racing it than, was the, than the local with... guy that, that would pick up garbage on the street. He just administered things. Jackie Stewart did the tape over on that thing hours after it happened. Jackie Stewart caused the problem to happen. That was done by, a, by an object of opportunity, just like it was for you, to all of a sudden win the race after the fact when you saw opportunity to take advantage of it. I'm sure we're going to revisit this a little bit later, uh, and I'm sure it's going to become even more contentious. I hope not, because I know that there no. was so much more with the 1981 Indianapolis 500 than just this situation, but we do need to move on. Jack, I read along with Bobby Unser and Mario Andretti. And Mario, at the end of that race, you were interviewed by Jackie Stewart and Jim McKay. And as Bobby pointed out previously, this was the way ABC did telecast back then. They actually taped the race, and then they had live segments. I, I must admit, though, when I saw you, as good as you looked back then, when I saw you there between Jackie and Jim McKay, you still had a look in your eye as if, gosh, I, I can't believe all of this is happening. When did you first realize that, A, a protest was going to be made, and B, you thought that you were done wrong in the Indianapolis 500? Well, uh, first of all, at, at that time, uh, we didn't have to lodge a protest. We did not protest. That's clear. Uh, and it's a normal procedure with Indianapolis to look at the tapes uh, overnight. In those days, they didn't have computers and so on and so forth. And then... That's why the race never became official until sometime early in the morning. 8 a.m. in so, the morning would be when it was... 8 a.m. in the morning. Okay, so uh, basically, all right, there was a, a dispute here because I, you know, I, we discussed it among ourselves, 
And we, you know, we were happy. Uh, I, I dispute the fact that Bobby says I saw an opportunity to win the race. Absolutely not. He, I, I knew that he had won the race. I felt he didn't have to do what he did. However, rule is a rule. Mm -hmm. And so the next morning I get a call from Jim McGee. I was still in bed. And he said, uh, Mario, he says, you won the race. And I said, oh, no. I said, now I got to get up and go take the photos and stuff. <laughs> so, uh, and we went through all that and then the banquet, of course, and everything else. Then they have the right to appeal. And then that's when things, to me, uh, got uh, sort of ugly in the sense that uh, it went outside of the rule book. If Bobby would have finished, crossed the line second, you know, he would have been penalized. End of story, the rule book would have applied because he finished first. Obviously, they had to look, you know, they just treated it totally different. And the fact, and I'll dispute that $40,000, it was clearly a fine, it's a matter of record, and if it was, a, if it was about covering costs, then we would have had to do the same thing, and then uh, we obviously, it, it, we didn't. So uh, the, the bottom line is, uh, it was, the only thing that I have is that the rule, the rule book was not applied to the guy that crossed the finish line first, no matter what the infraction. And uh, I don't dispute the fact that Bobby was faster, and I, I know the fact that I didn't deserve to win that race. Not on the track, I certainly didn't. By the rule book, yes. Bobby, do you think that any of this would still be talked about or debated if Jackie Stewart and Jim McKay had not, in what we call in the business, during post-production, made such a big deal about the pass? That's right. In fact, Jack, it, it, uh, that's what everybody really should know. All of that voiceover with Jackie, Tom Benford, all of those people that, that supposedly made a decision on this thing was done way after the race. Nothing to do with during the race. There was no penalty, nothing considered during the race. The officials did not see Bobby Unser have done anything wrong. Bobby where were you because Jim McKay said they made an effort as they were successful in getting getting uh, Mario there on the set at, at the end of the telecast which would have been about oh uh, 11 o'clock Indianapolis time where were you they said they could not reach you that's another blatant lie and I mean a really blatant lie I was I was in my hotel room at Hojo's right down on the corner of high school in the freeway and I had my own telephone number listed in the telephone book and Lord only knows they could have gotten me there. So that's a standard press way of saying they did something when you can't prove them wrong. But I promise you, I was there. I slept there all night. I didn't go out to eat. I didn't celebrate any place. I was dog tired. Mario, I would pose the same question to you. Do you think that we would still be discussing all of this if ABC had not made such a big deal about it on their telecast? Well, the bottom line is, uh, in those days, the procedure was they're penalized after they look at the tapes overnight when they go through the entire running of the race. And that was a normal procedure. After that, you know, I agree with Bobby. One of the rules that they put in place was, you know what, if there's going to be a penalty that's that severe, call the guy in then. If, if he would have been warned during the race, maybe he could have made it right, which you can do, and gone back to... Uh, where he needed to be at the start of that race and avoid the penalty. But in, that in those days, they never did that. They just wrote down, okay, this guy, this is an X. You know, we're going to get him later. And, and that's how this works. So I'm not sure that the fact that ABC brought it up was, uh, you know, was the culprit of this. I think it might have been, uh, they might have caught it during uh, the uh, total examination of the tapes uh, of the running of the race. Uh, uh, so... Again, that's, um, you know, that's something that uh, we'll never know, probably, obviously. And that's a subject that we will continue to debate when we return with more on the aftermath. Welcome back to Classic Big Ticket, the 1981 Indianapolis 500. I'm Jack Aroot. In case you missed the almost surreal series of events in the race, here's a synopsis of what transpired. One day after Bobby Unser took the checkered flag, USAC officials declared Mario Andretti the winner after Unser was penalized one full lap for violating a race procedure called the blend rule. With that ruling, Mario Andretti became the first driver at Indy to win from the last row. 
Roger Penske, Bobby Unser's car owner, appealed the race results, contending that Unser's car had been unfairly penalized and that Andretti's car had also illegally passed other cars from the pit area onto the track. It took the entire summer of 1981 to resolve. But when the dust settled, Bobby Unser was reinstated, the winner of the Indianapolis 500. A three-man panel ruled that a fine of $40,000 would replace the one-lap penalty. The panel said that since the violation could have been detected at the time it was committed, a one-lap penalty was too severe. Here was Mario Andretti's reaction after the ruling on October 8, 1981. They chose not to punish him a lap. They chose to only punish him a fine, give him a fine of $40,000, uh, only because he was the winner and they didn't think the race should have been taken away from him. In other words, uh, uh, almost like uh, stating that uh, a winner should be treated differently under this, uh, this case. And, uh, and that's part of, that part is very unacceptable to me. Bobby, would it be safe to say that the crux of this disagreement may revolve around the interpretation of what the blend rule was back in 1981? Because I'm a bit confused. It, it seems as if you're explaining it one way, where the blend rule is a case of coming out of turn two, and Mario is explaining it as the line and the cone that we saw uh, on the video that was at the exit of Pitt Road. Well, there's a, there's a giant disagreement right there. That's true. But let me just point out one other thing, Jack, that, that'll simplify it just a little bit of whether I'm right or whether Mario's right. There is no, and you can check the USAC records on this, there was never a penalized rule written for this supposed infraction. In other words, let's just say that Mario's right and that I was wrong. What was the penalty? Where was the penalty written? Where was the penalty verbally given? It was never given, it was never written. So whenever you leave the pits, as long as you were, and especially in the yellow, see, you could not blend in to the, to the group of cars in between turn one and two. That was against the rules and in the rule books. But also it said, said that you must blend in coming off of turn two and it had a specific place over there marked for that. Now, how can that be not understood by anybody? All the drivers understood it. One of the things that I did, Mario, is, is I talked to Al Unser, I talked to Johnny Rutherford, and I talked to, to A.J. Foyt. All of them, as I think you both would agree, were in that race in 1981. And they don't quite understand what all the brouhaha was about because their understanding, unsolicited by me, they didn't know that we were going to be doing this, said that the rule back in 1981 was, as Bobby Unser says, you pull out onto the safety apron, you, and, and the exact quote of, a, of A.J. Foyt was, you could pass as many cars as you wanted, Jackie, as long as you didn't pass A, the pace car, and B, the lead car, the car that was in the lead. Are, are they mistaken I wanna, the I way Bobby say, is too, Mario? I, I want to say on this one, uh, Jack, because uh, when, I, when I saw this happening, and I radio back to Jim McGee. I said, what in the world's going on? I said, Bobby's going right out to the front. And Jim said, hold it. Do what you're supposed to do. He said, don't pass a car. And I mean, this is clear. I don't care how Bobby twists it or turns it. This was agreed at the driver's meeting. You had to be in the driver's meeting that. And that's why the end of the wall was the absolute point, the break point where you blend it behind Whatever car was alongside of you, you were supposed to blend behind when you exited turn two. If you read clearly what the conclusion was, after all this, yes, Bobby did pass the cars, however, however, in this instance, the penalty is too severe. No matter how you slice the cake, these guys like, like H.J. Foyt tell a lie to benefit Bobby Answer, not anyway. Rutherford, not anyway. Yeah. My brother, Ah, uh, you could question Al sometimes, <laughs> but he wouldn't do it either. Because they all saw it as it was. But so did all the other drivers, the Benton houses, all the guys in the race. And yet two decades later, more than two decades later, we continue to debate this. Now, I know the two of you coming up, as you alluded to earlier in the show, driving sprint cars, driving midgets, you crossed paths and became good friends. What about now? What is this, what is this entire debate and this 1981 Indy 500 done to your relationship let's start with bobby i will just say this i've always loved mario to death he's been one of my heroes all of my life that part 
will never go away because of this race, even though it's the biggest race in the world. But he still did what he shouldn't have done, and that bothered me deeply inside. Do I have any resentment in any way uh, toward Bobby as a person? No. Like I said, we, you know, we co covered a lot of ground together, and uh, right from the beginning, a lot of battles, and uh, a lot of sweat, and a lot of laughing, and a lot of tears. And, um, and, you know, something like this cannot change that. Again, I never held him uh, responsible for that directly. I just thought that there was a rule and there was a rule. It's either going to be applied or not. But it was not his doing that I really faulted. I faulted USAC the way they conducted it. I must say, maybe we just are never going to really get to the complete bottom of this. But one thing I would like to do is thank both of you for joining us today on Classic Big Ticket and uh, wish you the best and remind you that in one case, Bobby Unser has the miniature Borg Warner Trophy, emblematic of winning the Indianapolis 500. But if you look for the 1981 Indy 500 championship ring, you'll have to look in the jewelry case of Mario Andretti. I'm Jack Aroot, and we want to wish happy trails to all our viewers here on ESPN Classic. I'll see you at the track next time when there will be only one winner. Thanks also to Jim McKay and the ABC Sports Production team who covered the 1981 Indianapolis 500. I'm Jack Aroot.